Hey, it's uh, John Reed with Brian Summer, the usual suspect. What's going on? Uh, we're just wrapping here at the uh, Acumatica Channel Partner and Release 2 Second Half 2017 event. Yeah, and we were under NDA all day yesterday, so we're going to have to put our listeners under NDA as well. If you listen to this podcast, you might be violating your own confidentiality, <laughs> so just so you know. Yeah, it was killing us, man. There wasn't hardly anything we could tweet about yesterday. Um, I know. And we're going to have to dance around some stuff. I hope we don't get into trouble, but because we're still technically under NDA for a lot of what we heard, but whatever. We're, we're forging on, Brian. All right. I wish I could show listeners a picture of us sitting in in this ambient noise environment. We're basically in a parking lot. It's a nice looking parking lot. Anyway. And it, it's a, and to its advantage, it's got the hip cool hotel kind of parking lot. And, it is. Uh, ambient view. It's kind of hip and cool. And uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about what we learned from Acumatica. And one of the reasons why I think listeners might be interested is because I think Acumatica is pushing some good envelopes in terms of what a modern ERP system might look like. And so it kind of provokes the question of what is that about and, and also how does that fit into overall notions of how companies should be changing, you know, disrupting before they get disrupted and all that crap. So, yeah. we're, so we're, where are we? So we're dealing right now with a company that um, is only nine years old and uh, started off building a solution using a lot of uh, predominantly like Microsoft and other tools and obviously, it wasn't going to be terribly functionally strong in the early days, but that has changed quite a bit. Anyway, they've got stuff running, and they have some multi-tenant and mega-tenant kind of versions of the product. Uh, I believe they said 50, no, closer to 60% of all customers are running at a multi-tenant fashion. Right. Uh, they do have some big, huge uh, channel partners and reseller networks, and I think it's some like 99% of their deal flow is coming from that. those two no uh, avenues. No direct sales force. Yeah, it's not really a direct deal. They, they tee up some leads. They, they do have some inside sales to yep. tee up leads for partners, but they don't close the leads. And then on top of that, uh, in terms of their strengths, you have areas like financials, uh, distribution, they have some CRM as well. They're not trying to be Salesforce quality CRM, like as far as the depth of functionality, but they, they offer CRM. Yep. And then they don't do much with HR, but they have some HR partnerships. And they're really big on platform. Yep. So one of their big things is basically one of the announcements today, they, they do a two year re- two, twice a year release cycle now for their customers. So today was R2, which is the second release of the year. So they make a bunch of functionality announcements. Correct. Such as the Open API partnership, which is part of their sort of ongoing platform play. But then they also made some announcements around. They had one, a big one on uh, project accounting. And it actually surprised me. There was a lot more meat on that bone than I thought they would probably have. It, it actually looked pretty good. And I'm a pretty rough judge on those PSA people. Now, anyway, no, it, uh, I, 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 guess the, I guess what I'm trying to say is my expectations were um, surpassed. And you, know, you could argue how low were they to begin with, but they were surpassed. So kudos to them. They also announced a... Um, uh, a big deal in the manufacturing space with uh, right. a partner, uh, Jazz, who has J A A S, who has a product, uh, Jams, J A M S. Manufacturing, which was built on the Acumatica platform for years now, uh, but, but now is officially part of the Acumatica line. Right. And uh, a nice fit for those who need, like, uh, discrete make to order make to uh make to um to stock and a number of other disciplines they they said you know they'll support a number of verticals including some that were a little bit of a surprise like in the uh, med devices and food areas where i know you have to have a lot of traceability and, and i spoke with some of the jams people at the event and i think they may actually have a lot of that already baked into the product so that's a good thing and also a big UX refresh. Yep. That was actually one of the bigger criticisms you could have made of Acumatica historically is kind of a new school product, but kind of an older school UX. And I think they've updated it sufficiently. 
it has they, a more intuitive modern feel now. Yeah, they fixed it up, and it's got a lot of integration with their business intelligence tools in there. Right. And every time you come into that system, you're just like, the users are going to be like, pow, hit in the face with a number of different metrics that are role-based and everything else for them. And I'm a big fan of that. I might, having gone to a ton of cloud ERP shows in the last year, I think data visibility is one of the big themes as far as what customer side is a core benefit and often a surprising one because when they started the implementation that wasn't always on the top of their minds but but visual being able to visualize data in real time is a real eye opener for companies cuz a lot of them are are going for spreadsheets you know yeah not only that but i think understanding the data i think is going to be the where the future's at for yeah. companies this stuff about um, printing out a bunch of reports or looking at the same old transaction data that ERP systems have been capturing for the last 30, 40 years isn't really moving the needle at all for companies from improving productivity or insight into the business. Uh, now everything's really around data, and more importantly, it's from data that's coming from non-ERP sources that maybe gets married up with operational dark data and big data to really figure out what we really ought to be doing as a business. Right. You think that a lot of today's ERP vendors are falling short in creating an opportunity for upstarts like Acumanica. Why is that? Well, um, okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of maxims in the software space, but one of them I think that's very important is that the best software companies don't worry about the customers they have. They focus on the customers to come. And it's always remarkable to see the delta between the capabilities and the underlying technology and the progression of the innovation in companies that are not encumbered with either a huge old install base or aren't worried about those. Uh, and what you end up with is companies that have some incredible flexibility and nimbleness. When companies start playing defense instead of offense, that's when you got to start worrying because they're not going to be the leaders in a market, almost by definition. Yeah, you've been talking a lot about uh, getting a little overheated talking about ERP vendors shale fracking their customers. Yeah, <laughs> my <fa> <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about that, too. All that bad behavior out in the market. Um, you know, uh, sadly, I think a lot of vendors just don't realize when they take on an adversarial relationship with their customers, it's a uh, surprise, surprise, it's going to have an adverse impact on their brand of the market. They're not going to be perceived in a very good light. Right. So where do you think Acumatica needs to take this? Because they have, they have a lot of things you could like from, from the dashboarding to mobile friendly to the, all their partnerships, that are their vertical strategy, which is pretty easy to handle on some level on their platform. But are there dangers they need to look out for as well? Okay, so this is a company that, as we said at the top of the broadcast, they're nine years old. And they're coming out of the awkward teen years and they've got to start thinking about what will the brand called Acumatica actually stand for? What does it really mean? And uh, the product is shaping up nicely from a functionality perspective. You look at the screens now, man, they've got all kinds of fields and elements and they're broadening out support into more and more verticals and sub-verticals. I get it. You know, the functionality is becoming more robust, but the brand has to be more than just some, you know, a collection of functions and features. And there was a lot of discussion the last couple of days that they've got a lot of the right characteristics to be one of the good guys in this space. Now we have to see if that's really a direction they'll want to go. Well, and I think the other interesting thing is that the for for a while, I was convinced that the cloud ERP market was going to ultimately be sort of a sweet market just because I just spent so many years dealing with the pains of integration and hearing stories around mm -hmm. the pains of integration. Acumatica takes a different tack, which is around the multi-cloud notion, right? And And I'm kind of a big fan of that because the notion is that if you apply APIs and open standards... Customers then have a lot more choice and are not as locked in. A lot of times, cloud relationships can just duplicate lock-in if you're just locked into the same vendors. So to be able to choose and say, hey, I want to use this payroll service or I want to use you know, this CRM product, but I still want to use Acumatica or what have you, I like that strategy. But, but the problem, Brian, is that integration doesn't really go away. I mean, 
you still need one throat to choke, so to speak. And what do you do when your when your API stops working on a weekend? Someone on the panel said that today. The panel you were on, I thought that was a good comment, which is you're still accountable for that on Monday morning. You can't go and say, oh, the API broke. It's not my problem. You know, your, yeah. your business leaders are going to have none of that. And in fact, this is, I think, a a big uh, inflection point in the market for software buyers. Software buyers, they they don't want to be in the hardware and utility computing business. They want to turn that over to the likes of an Amazon or Google or somebody like that. They don't want to be in the application maintenance business, which is why they want multi-tenant solutions. Let the vendor take care of that. And they definitely don't want to be in the, in the integration business. Right. And it's nice. We heard a lot at this event about all kinds of new improvements in not only APIs, but in tools that would make the API connections go so much quicker and faster and put right. them together. But here's the real opportunity. It's not for the customer. It's really for the channel partners uh, of and the resellers for companies like Acumatica. They need to step up the game, and they need to make the, if you will, the insurance around always on, always working integrations as really a part of the service they provide right. over the, the entirety of the lifetime that a customer is using these core products. Which means they have to embrace that as a competency and, and really own it. Yeah. You, it, had, you had referred to a vendor, I think, in the, in the Workday ecosystem at one point that had built like 150 integrations or something. And so, so the ability to sort of take responsibility for a lot of that can, can differentiate you as a partner. Absolutely. Uh, I know yeah. one partner that maintains a library of about 1,200 common HR integrations, and they pretest every single one of those every time right. a new release of this major HR software comes out on the market. And having done that, they do a huge service for these customers, and those customers, in return, pay them an annual fee for making that available for them. It's insurance. So I'm developing like this working theory of cloud ERP value stages, if you will, without idealizing cloud too much, but just with the notion that, that when I talk with customers, the first things I hear about as far as benefits are much simpler things as far as simplifying systems, standardizing our processes. We got off a lot of the old crap. We have a single source of truth. So that's the first benefit, but then they start seeing the visibility from the dashboards. And that's kind of the second phase is is data visibility to make better decisions. But but you're still not really fundamentally changing your business model at that point. You might figure some things out as far as, hey, you know, this store needs a certain kind of inventory earlier than we thought, or, you know, why is this region struggling? But you're not fundamentally changing your business model. I think the next stage beyond that in the sort of modern ERP journey is business model transformation, right? Huge. Where the, where the data sort of gives you clues, but it might not be the end of it, right? You might be wanting to change products into services or whatever it is, go into subscription mode on certain things that you never sold before. Maybe your warehouse space can be leased in certain capacities that you didn't realize. The data points you in the direction, but that's not a business model in itself, right? You still have to reinvent. And I think that's what you're talking about when you talk about all the big data and the external data sources. You can't make these business model transformations just based on your own internal data. That's the problem. 100% agree. And if you're thinking that using a system that's predominantly driven around the four walls of the enterprise, it's not going to give you that kind of insight. It was never designed for that. It never had the data model and it never and the people who created that software 20 30 40 years ago initially never envisioned that they would have such access to unconstrained technology unlimited data storage unbelievable computer processing power and on and on and on that just wasn't what they thought about back then so they optimized those old solutions in the past to do you know to do a couple of things to do transaction processing well to do computationally intensive and labor intensive things well and every one of those things happened within the four walls of the enterprise today uh, if you really want to figure out how you're going to transform a company you have to have much more information whether it's coming from social sentiment feeds weather feeds satellite imagery and I go on and on and on and you're not going to be able to connect that up if you got a freaking dog's breakfast of internal right. transaction systems today. you got to clean this up and you, so that you can be ready to take advantage, so you can put all this in the right kind of like dashboards and cloud utilities and everything else to crunch it. 
so modern ERP becomes a key component of what you're describing, but it's not all that you need, right? Because no. what you're describing is a situation where there's other vendors and other tools that are going to be necessary because the cloud ERP system, you're not going to be pulling all your external data into your cloud ERP system. So give, what are you going to do? I'll give you a great example. Um, you go to a manufacturer, when they start wiring up every asset they have, whether right. it's machine tools, uh, vehicle fleets, you know, delivery trucks, whatever, they're putting sensors on everything. You realize like 99% of all that sensor data that's going to be reported off these devices is just standard status reporting that says, hey, I'm sensor five, here's my location, nothing new is going on. You're not going to put all that in an ERP system. You're not going to put it in a system that was never designed for that volume of information. At least when you were processing transactions in an ERP system, these were critical things that absolutely needed to be recorded. Inventory right. moved, we made a sale, we got to pay a vendor, whatever. But this stuff, it's just you're drowning in this, and you need a different way of handling some of that information. And ERP systems, I'm sorry, they were never designed to process emails, right. photographs, and a whole bunch of other stuff, the, all the other non-structured data that's out there. W you know, I think the, I'm not saying that you have to ring fence ERP. I'm not saying that you won't, in, you know, make the connections. But I think there's another whole generation of technology that's evolving outside of ERP that will have to play nice with ERP right. for companies to get great value. I think we've overstayed our, our welcome here. But thanks for the deconstruction. Any final thought? No, I'm actually uh, I'm looking forward to heading back to Logan and uh, oh, getting nice. some work done before the day completely ends because i got a busy day tomorrow. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, Brian. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, John.